Hi, this is Andy. And hi, this is Sunny. And you are listening to the Business Over Chai podcast. Our mission is to share startup stories that will inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs across the South Asian community. Mehak is the owner of Bindas Eatery, an eclectic celebration of food touring customers through the hustle and bustle of India. She's also the winner of Westfield's Food Entrepreneur Award in 2018. Bindas Eatery is located in Mayfair and the restaurant has been featured in East London Girl Blog, CNN Traveller and Square Mile. Well, Mehak, it's so good to have you on the show. Um, it's been awesome to speak to you in prior conversations. We'd love to start off by hearing your story, um, family upbringing, where you were born, uh, maybe some of your educational experience as well, um, and how uh, life has started before you actually come upon uh, starting this business. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I guess I went to uni uh, in Kingston. I grew up in Wiltshire, uh, born in Basildon, so otherwise known as Bas Vegas, right? Um, <laughs> grew up in the countryside um, from Wiltshire. Uh, early schooling uh, was in Bath. Uh, went to boarding school. Um, did a degree in law. Uh, hated it. Uh, then I went into business and marketing. And now I'm a restaurateur. So yeah, it's just been a bit of a whirlwind journey. What was uh, life like living in Basildon and maybe n- not so maybe city centric or uh, the hustle and bustle of living in the city? We left Essex actually when I was only a toddler. So I don't really have any recollection of Essex. So earliest memories would be out in the countryside whilst everyone else was going to cinema. I was um, on dirt bikes and quad bikes around the countryside. So that's, that's pretty much my upbringing. That sounds pretty cool. And yeah, we'd love to kind of understand a bit about your family and uh, how entrepreneurship is a big part of your family. So could you tell us a bit about that? Entrepreneurship is a huge part of my family. Business sort of runs in uh, my family's blood um, on both my mum's side as well as my dad's side. So my dad actually had a degree in interior designing and um, he started off a major pharmaceutical company with his brothers and um, they were big players back in the day. And then of course, you know, family gets involved and a feud unfortunately happen. Um, they all parted ways, but my dad sort of um, started up his own business again. Um, and then he started his own property company and he has pretty much taught me everything that I know. And he's probably one of the greatest business people that I've actually met till date. So it's a really, really strong um, business background that I do actually come from. And I've been very, very fortunate enough to learn from him. So, so did you always have it in your mind that you wanted to perhaps follow in their footsteps, Mehek? Or, or were you seriously considering a legal degree, uh, like a legal career when you were pursuing the legal degree? Seriously, I was actually really considering um, becoming a sister, getting my training contract, obtaining everything, doing everything that I should do and getting that vocational degree that every Asian parent sort of wants you to strive for and achieve. But in the back of my head, I always kind of knew that it wasn't really completely for me. Um, I really hated paralegaling. Um, I did not enjoy law school at all. And I just felt that I just always felt like something wasn't quite right or I wasn't feeling happy. And I think when you wake up every morning and dread going to work and dread going to the office, um, I think that's a sure sign of actually, you know, a career change is really, really important. I always kind of have always been interested in business. Um, I've always had a little bit of entrepreneurial flair. So back at school, I used to sell those alien eggs that everyone used to say, yeah. if you put them together, they would breed and then this would happen and that would happen. <laughs> so I got, so I used to go and sell those alien eggs at school and um, I got actually, I was actually put in detention for profiteering. So I've always wow. had a little bit of business blood in me, I guess you could say. Very interesting. Um, so then, so you decided uh, law wasn't for you, perhaps, and then you mentioned you went into business and marketing. So w- what did you end up doing then? I worked in um, a forensic accounting firm uh, based in the city. 
Um, then afterwards, I moved on to a forensic architecture, architecture firm, whereby the architects would act as expert witnesses um, in legal cases. And I would be working on their development strategies, client retention strategies, um, and looking for new revenue streams for the business and develop that I could actually exercise my entrepreneurial flair and my business acumen through those channels. I was working there for a year or so. My parents sort of called me actually when I was about to get a promotion to become a marketing manager there and said that you seem to be working on all these business development and marketing initiatives for other companies. Don't you think you should be employing what you've learned back home in the family business? Um, and at first I was a little bit skeptical to go and work for my dad because my dad's like a tyrant. And I thought, oh my God, I have to, am I going to be able to work with him day in, day out? Um, and also it'd mean like going back to Wiltshire and moving out of the big smoke. So I decided that I was just going to go for it and, you know, help the family business and actually try and, and actually put into practice what I'd learned. Um, and touch wood, like, it, you know, the business started flourishing. We started doing more developments. Um, we started adding to the portfolio. And um, yeah, things just sort of spiraled from there. And they were just it was just sort of making good, uh, making more money, good money. Um, and I was learning a lot more uh, working for my dad. But I guess I still felt like this overwhelming sense of wanting to do something on my own without having to like take over the reins, so to speak, as in my family business. Yeah. So do you think that some of the stuff you learned in your marketing role, you brought straight into your family business and that was kind of helping the, the propelling of your family business or was it just something else entirely that you felt that you brought in? Um, no, I think I'd learned a lot um, from my previous roles. So I think more so on the client, I think more so on like the actual software side of things, how to harness information, like putting into a CRM system, for example, building up good relationships um, and also going to meetings, carrying out presentations that also helped develop my confidence um, a lot. Um, and also gave me those confidence then to like go and talk to contractors and to, you know, massive uh, landlords that were looking to add on to their portfolios and do JVs. So for sure, like I definitely learned, so I definitely took skills from my previous role as well as developing it further in the family business. That's interesting. I think you see that quite often with, um, I'm not saying this about your particular business, uh, Mehek, but uh, you see this with businesses that uh, perhaps the first generation started, you know, from Asian backgrounds and they're very good at what they do, but in terms of enhancing their profitability or, you know, trying new methods of getting new business, um, they're perhaps somewhat slower or behind what other businesses are doing. So I guess when children such as you and yourself are helping family businesses, they can, you know, add a new spark of life to that business and make that flourish even further. I agree a hundred percent. I think um the I think the older generation have a mentality of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which mm. is not the way to have it's not the way to conduct business because everyone knows in business it's an ever-changing economic climate and you have to evolve with the times um, and that's the only way that businesses really truly survive and so which year did you start working for your family business and how long did that last until you moved on to going into food i started working at my family business in 2013 and then i took the plunge i guess all the foodie stuff that i started with blogging and making those initiatives like the pop up and all that sort of stuff it only really happened from 2018 onwards got it okay cool i mean i guess that might be a good segue into the food stuff that you were really interested in meg when we spoke before you told us how passionate you are about cooking and you would you know host these amazing uh meals with with friends family um and you know this kind of sparked this whole new journey and that's why you're in the space of food today could you kind of talk about your initial passions where that even came from and then how you this led you into blogging food and uh, moving on to uh, setting up a pop-up that you won uh, in a competition coming from a small family i guess the only thing that sort of brings you all together is really food and cooking food and sharing food and meeting up to eat food and going out and doing things. So I think um, I had developed a skill pretty early on because um, I didn't really have any mentors to learn off. And 
as all Asians have dinner parties at home and they have, you know, parties for this person, that person, or someone's just had a mundan done or something, they'd always have these gatherings. So um, my mum used to host these dinner parties and a lot of the, one auntie actually made a comment and said, oh, we know what we're going to get when we come to your house for dinner because you only know how to make four things. And it was getting really embarrassing that I had to say to mum, I was like, can you not make anything else? I was like, so-and-so's mum can make damalu, so-and-so's mum can do this. And then my mum said to me once, if you think you can do better, then do it yourself. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it myself. We used to go to India every summer holiday. So I decided that when I'd go to India, I'd bring back all the spices um, and learn how to cook myself. So I made my grandma take me to, you know, on the markets over there and just to basically go get everything. Yep. So I packed up a suitcase full of spices. Uh, there's all those like, you know, MDH boxes and this, you know, something like Cindy Briani or this or that. I literally picked up a packet of absolutely everything, came home, brought the suitcase back. And my mom said, what's this? And I said, you told me that if I thought I could do any better or I can make any better and I want to eat better, I've got to do it myself. And she said, okay. So I just started experimenting in the kitchen and then I learned how to make a vegetable biryani. So that was the first thing I actually ever made. Um, and I did not expect um, everyone to really wolf and inhale it um, all in one go. And I think it just sort of just started from there that I just became the designated cook of the family. So I, always ho I used to always host dinner parties. I used to always bake people's birthday cakes, make people's Christmas cakes. I used to make up catering packs for families um, and for my friends to like serve in their own homes. And I used to really enjoy it. And I think that also I was, I've been fortunate to travel uh, quite extensively. So I've picked up a lot of um, skill and flair from actually watching other people and understanding different flavors, understanding different cuisine, understanding different cooking methods. So it just sort of just spiraled from there really. And I think I've always been, I always knew that I had something, I, I always knew I had some type of alignment with food or food and beverage, but I just, I think that you never really quite have the confidence to pursue it. It's always sort of been drilled into your head. You must become a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, a pharmacist, or this, or an engineer. So I never really actively pursued it until I got married and did everything that I was supposed to do. So, yeah. Okay. So obviously you were getting some good feedback then, Mehek, from friends and family and uh, you were preparing packs for them and doing birthday party, you know, cakes and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so is that where the blogging came about? You thought you should probably put that out there on the web and see what kind of response you got? Yeah, I think um, I just got married and um, I'm just going to be completely open about this. I got married. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I got the degree, I was running the business, I was making money, I could make money and I could make roti, so I could do everything. But I just um, felt like something was missing. And also I think um, I was going through a bit of a down period after I got married, because I think that after I got married, I felt almost like pressured into being a certain way. And I think I felt that pressure from both you know, my in-law side as well as my family side. And I, and I think that after you get married, you kind of feel torn and that you're in the middle and you're almost like in a pressure cooker. And I felt like I was in this pressure cooker and I was doing everything for everybody else. I wasn't happy and I was not doing what I really wanted. And I think that um, towards the end of like our first year of getting married, I just sort of had this like realization moment of why am I not doing something for myself? And if I want to do something for myself, I should have, to, I, I need to be strong enough to basically quieten all those voices everywhere from all sides of every family, as well as voices of like disbelief in myself and actually just go for it. So I remember sitting at my dressing table and I just started an Instagram account and I said, okay, fine. I made this salmon recipe with Samfire yesterday. I'm just going to upload it and see what happens. When did that actually begin, the blogging? December 2017, it started. And then I did my first supper club in April 2018. My husband actually bought me that as like my 30th birthday gift to like cook for everybody else, which was fantastic and very stressful. So I created <laughs> my first supper club for 30 people, which was great. And it was just actually the first time I'd been in a commercial space 
but with domestic appliances so I was still okay um, in order to cook um, and serve out for that many people. Then I realized that after cooking for that many people, designing a menu, explaining to them why I had fed them what I had fed them and why I created what I created and having a unanimous good reception over the food and sort of a unanimous oh my god this is amazing and my food was genuinely making people happy my desserts my cocktails my drinks everything I realized I could actually really do this as a career but I still did not have the confidence after doing the supper club to know and pinpoint exactly which area of food and beverage I wanted to go into whether it's food writing, food photography, food styling, whether it's having a restaurant, whether it's having a pop-up, whether it's catering, because the, the field is so open for this industry. And then after the supper club, that's when I saw the Westfield Entrepreneur Competition advertised on hot dinners. And then again, I had that dressing room moment of just go for it. And I just went for it. Can you just explain how the supper club worked, uh, Mehek? So was it your friends or was it open to the public? How, how, did, that, how did that come about and how did it work? Uh, my husband booked the supper club. So he, so he basically booked the venue. Uh, the venue tells us how many people it can seat. And the venue gives you an inventory of what's there. So this particular venue could host up to 40 seated people. But we sh- I, said, I said 30. No more than that. Um, I just wanted to deal with like an, a small number that I could actually, ha- well, small, a number that I could handle. Um, so what I did was I had announced on my Instagram that I was going to do a supper club. And this was going to be the menu. This is what I wanted to do. And um, the price is going to be, you know, £30 per head. And if anybody wants to come, please DM me and do a, a bank transfer, a bank transfer. And then their seat would be confirmed. And literally, it was just a mixture of like friends, family, a few random people. And I had sold out overnight. Like I didn't expect like my inbox to be going ping, 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 ping. And I was like, okay, cool. This is a bit worrying, but fine. Like, oh, you know, people seem to be liking the menu. Let's just go for it. And um, then I literally had posted the next day that I'm really sorry, but I've actually sold out my supper club then I was getting DMs from people saying when's the next one when's the next one and I was like I'll let you know (laughs) let's see if I can get the first one done out of the way first um so yeah that's how it worked so I guess that was your first foray into kind of like how a restaurant would operate right you know you had to think about menu think about pricing you know think about the logistics of making food for such you know a large quantity of people yeah um, that was your fourth foray into restauranteering i guess yeah it was it was like a really it was a it was a little insight as to what it took in order to cook and roll out the food i think more so on like preparation getting getting everything hot done out you know out in time uh, i didn't make any money from it at all i just I, I barely broke even but it was just more of a it was more of a an exercise for me to see if i really did have the capacity to stand on my two feet and actually do it um, in like a small concentrated pressure capacity. Um, and it turns out, yes, I'm Gordon Ramsay. Yes, I F and I blind and I say all sorts of wrong things I shouldn't say, but the food gets out on time. People are happy. It tastes good. And that's all that matters. I love how you're so straight up to the point (laughs) when you're explaining all of this and it sounds like you know entrepreneurs when you think about them generally they you know and i've got this experience as well being an entrepreneur and setting up my own small business is that we can often be really scared as you describe like when you're like i'm not sure if this is going to work but actually you know what i'm just gonna you know make a make a small event and set this up and test it and i think that's the biggest amount of you know it's a point in which you need to, you know, have a certain amount of courage. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs just get so bogged down into the bits and pieces and how um, perfect things have to be, but you just did it and you, you were focused on, you know, not 40 people, but 30 at first, just to say, okay, let me just test the market, test it before entering this, this food industry. So that was really, really interesting. Was that quite a nerve wracking thing for you? Or do you think that, you know, you had it all fixed and uh, set up and planned uh, before you went into that? Um, If I'm completely honest, I still didn't have the confidence. So this was actually a birthday gift that my husband bought for me. 
And he just sort of sprung it upon me and said, you have basically till April to do it. When do you want to do it? And I, I think I had lost um, a lot of confidence. Uh, I'm just being honest. I think I'd lost my confidence a lot. So when he'd, when he'd actually bought it for me as a gift and said, this is what you're going to do, and sort of threw me in the deep end, he knows that I thrive in being thrown in the deep end because I will find my way and I will just get things organized. And because I, ha because I have that knowledge of, okay, fine, I can do my forecasting. I know where I can get my products from. I know how much it's going to cost. I can do this. And if I really think about what I've got, like equipment wise in there in order to do the inventory and how I'm going to plan everything and actually, and actually do the strategy and how many people I'm going to sit, what menu can I do? Cause that can be easily rolled out. What requires less cooking time? What has less pan work? I was, I'm very, very methodical in my thinking of how I'm going to do everything. So I think in the planning of it, I managed to get my confidence. So I managed to get that confidence and that real spark to be like, you know what? I can actually do this. And if it doesn't work, it's also fine. And I guess your confidence did come back, Meg, because then that led to you entering the uh, Westfield competition. Could you, could you talk about that competition in particular and how that came about and what it entailed? Yeah, so uh, Westfield had announced on various platforms uh, through radio, through social media, um, that they were looking um, for the next new food entrepreneur. Um, and they were looking for the next new food entrepreneur. Just It was more of like a marketing stunt that they first started doing because FNB is up and coming. They had just done an event with body with the body coach, Joe Wicks, um, at the Stratford Westfield, I think a year, I think two years prior. Then they had just launched the competition at Westfield Stratford because they had a new wing that had opened up there. And in 2017, Bex, um, who does the vegan um, breakfast pots and stuff, um, she uh, basically won it in 2017. So what? So Westwood decided to roll it out for another year because they have a new wing that's opened up um, in Westfield. They've got a whole new parade that's opened up there in Westfield, White City. So they were looking, hopefully, for another operator, a new operator, an independent to also possibly come and take one of the units or do something in order to try and drive footfall into the new wing. So uh, the initial application form was talk about yourself, your experience, identify whether you were a concept, um, a pop-up, uh, if you were an existing operator and how long you've been training for. You had to describe what your concept was. You had to describe what your concept was. You had to describe um, why you should win it um and also what your usp was so i had filled in that form uh submitted it off um got to the next stage so the next stage was that we had to write up a menu price it up take pictures of our food and explain exactly what it is that we wanted to cook i then spent two days taking pictures and all angles of my, my whole menu like i don't know what angles i was getting pictures of like baby corn and Kuchumba, seriously, um, I was taking pictures, I was writing descriptions, I was trying to use my personality through the menu to try and explain to them like who I was. <laughs> so I tried to really express who I was through those menu descriptions and those pictures. And I really, really went to town on making sure that everything was as clear, as professional looking. I got graphics done, everything as possible, just so that I could really, well, I could really sort of stand apart from the other competitors, basically, and, and the other candidates. After getting through to the next round, then the next round was we had to submit some type of business plan and what our ethos was and what our branding was about and just who we were, really. So submitted that, then we got through. Then there was a finalist round uh, where there was five of us that had to do a live cook-off. So it was literally a live cook-off um, in the middle of the shopping centre, the new wing, uh, at the new wing so what they did was um they had like a small um uh porter kitchen set up they had two little benches they had some inductions some pans um and we had to come with one one dish like our signature dish that we wanted to bring and also our business plans and just talk about why we should win judges who were there we had uh, jonathan prim from the evening standard rich and vines from bloomberg 
Eats, and then we had my mentor, um, Omar Lula Boy from Tapas Revolution, and also we had Jeremy Pang, the uh, the great guy that owns School of Walk, um, and all those like wow. Pan Asian street food lines. So it was um, a little bit nerve wracking. I got there as per usual, like an hour and a half early. I went with my dad and I went with my husband. I was the only person that came in with three massive crates. Everybody else came in with like small cool bags. And I just thought to myself, do they know this competition or have I just gone like full out master chef? And have I just really like, you know, gone to town on this? Have I gone a bit OTT? I came with massive A3 boards, you know, like boards, you know, to put on top of the easel with who I was, my menu, my branding, everything. Like literally, I probably needed a fourth person to help carry everything first person was up and she was doing a completely different concept with like sweet potato Portuguese bread and I was the second person that's up, that, that was up I came in with my butter chicken bomb burger but they had asked for one dish but I brought in two so I brought in my bar budgie too and they did say to me we did only ask one I said yes but if, if somebody's a vegetarian then what am I going to do then you can't taste it so I thought I was trying to be clever I was <laughs> so I went <laughs> I got that I literally took everything out. Like I had, whilst this other girl was basically giving her pitch and her presentation as to what she was producing, it was my job then to start to start prepping my food. So she'd be pitching and presenting, then I'd be behind her getting everything ready. So of course, while she's pitching and presenting, I pull out my three massive crates. And then I've got obviously my three massive boards. Um, and then I'm getting all my slates out, my little copper ramekins and handies, and I'm doing everything. And I'm just like literally running around, sorting everything out behind her. Richard ended up leaving the girl that was presenting. He ended up leaving what he ended up leaving the presentation just to look over the counter, just to see what I was doing. He goes, oh, are you doing Indian food? I love Indian food. I was like, yeah, I am. I was like, I'm doing some uh, makini for you now. He goes, oh, I love butter chicken. I was like, okay cool hopefully you're gonna like this then so started cooking started assembling everything and as soon as the first girl had finished presenting all of the judges came over to the bench to have a look to see what I was doing and they were asking me questions and they were asking me what was going in and they were asking me why I was here and then I just sort of said can we talk about this in five minutes let me just can I just get everything ready for you make sure it's looking smelling and tasting perfect and then you can ask me all the questions that you want. So, so this is like a this is like a live cooking contest yeah. in the middle of Westfield, right? Yeah, in right, the okay. middle of the shopping center. So people were stopping and taking pictures and videos of us, thinking that it was something like we were like celebrities or something. We really were. We were just trying to compete for a space so we could, you know, have a pop up there for two weeks. Um, and then the people were stopping as soon as they could, as soon as they started smelling, you know. I think ghee has that like really nice smell as soon as you start heating it up that it, it has a, like, a yeah. really good aroma. So as soon as the ghee started to heat up in the pans, everybody was stopping and looking to see what we were cooking and if there were any samples going out. Um, there, was one, <laughs> there was one spectator that actually had to be removed because he kept asking for a, butter piece, oh, for, for a piece of butter chicken. Um, and my dad was like taking a video and was like, move out the way, move out the way, move out the way. And I was like, God, this is so embarrassing. I've not even done my pitch or my presentation yet. So prepared everything, got everything out to the judges. They ate everything. And then it came time, uh, then it was time for me to do my pitch and my presentation. Pitch, presentation, business plan delivered, sat a back at Ollie and Steed like a bag of nerves. And then the third person went and the fourth person went and the fifth person went. And um, they told us that they were going to announce the winner three days later. But I think um, they had seen that it was such a long day. They had decided to take a break and actually announce the winner the same day. I must have drank about four coffees, had about two pastries, mm. and literally like ate so much avocado, like just waiting <laughs> to hear what the news was. Then they called us all back and then they announced the winner. And... When I won, I really was not gracious at all. We're just going to take a quick break. If you like what you're hearing, please remember to hit the subscribe button and we'd love to hear your feedback. So please remember to leave us a review.
You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter on our handle Business Over Chai or on our website at businessoverchai.com. Thanks again and now back to the podcast. You know, you get some people, they're like, oh, oh my God, well done. You did so well. Oh my God. I was like, yes, 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 me, me, me. And then I just like, ran in the middle of all of them and gave them all a group hug. And then um, I just realized that I needed to have a little bit more decorum and be a bit more gracious and a bit, you know, a bit more well-mannered, I guess you could wow. say. And just say, oh, well done. It was so lovely to meet you and all that. And more, like all the niceties out. So once I realized um i just said thank you to the judges and thanked like all the candidates and then it just all started from there really like when i was uh, i won the space at westfield and so what we had the the prize was to have a pop-up space there for two two weeks so they would pay for rent and rates but everything else was your own cost your own staffing your food graphics everything else is your own cost so yeah so, so clearly that meant a lot to you, right? I mean, heck, I mean, for you to celebrate like that in the middle of Westfield, you know, clearly it was uh, it was very important to you. Was it important because you felt that's your kind of way to progress in the Indian food or in the, in the food and beverage industry, or or was it that you just wanted to prove that you know you can do this, or you just wanted to prove that you can make good food? What what was it that was so important to you? I think it's everything. I think it was that like I am capable of doing this. I know my food is good and I know that sounds really, really pompous, but I, it was the first time doing anything in life where I truly felt confident and I wasn't actually nervous. The only time that I was nervous obviously was waiting for the results, but you know, I really felt that I really, 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 really pulled it out the bag. And I just felt that winning it was just like that aha moment that I wanted that this really could be a new business for me this that I really could do something in this industry yeah I mean it almost felt like it it most probably felt like it was like validating that this was you know something that I really wanted you've done the supper club now and now you've done won this competition in the middle of a busy shopping center in fact one of the most popular ones in the world Westfield and now you've been crowned Westfield food entrepreneur and so yeah that must have been a massive achievement yeah it was I think I'm kind of like okay Wow. And then, yeah, I met Omar afterwards after the competition had finished. And after when it was announced, he'd asked me to come up to his restaurant just to have a quick chat, just to talk about the mentorship and what to expect and when the pop-up was going to be um, and what I could expect from him and how he was going to help really shape um, my dream, I guess you could say. Um, and the knowledge that I gained from him was completely invaluable. So he mentored me for about nine, nine months, I guess you could say. Nine months, um, probably for about an hour every three weeks, every three or four weeks. But he was always available on the phone whenever I needed to talk or something. But in order to plan the pop-up, that took a long time. It was not one of those overnight things. It was, it was something that took a good nine months to plan. Could you talk about Omar as your mentor? I mean, it's clear that he was a very important person in your journey through at least the pop-up. And we haven't even got to the restaurant yet that you've uh, set up in uh, in London as well. But um, could you talk about who Omar is, his background, and some of the key things you learned from him that you you felt that were, you know, just something that you could never have learned without his help? Um, It's more so the insight of running a restaurant. The costs involved, the things you need to look out for, how to control your margins, um, how to control GP, all that sort of stuff I learned from him. Um, he also pointed me in the right direction of the correct supplies I needed to go um, and use. Um, I don't use all of them now um, in my in my existing restaurant, but they were good. They were good supplies to use when doing the pop up purely because they supply to Westfield, so they understood the T's and C's that West would have in place in order for you to even get anything through their doors um, to facilitate the rest, to, to facilitate your restaurant, sorry. Um, so Omar, uh, Omar's background is that he used to work for Gordon Ramsay. He was spotted um, by somebody at Westfield. Um, it was actually the head of food and be- head of food and beverage. She'd spotted him and said, I want you to make me a tapas like concept here at Westfield and she put him in touch with 
a couple of other people who were investors, whereas Omar was sort of the talent and also the knowledge, but he needed the investment and the backing behind him in order to actually take on something like Westfield and then build up a chain of restaurants. So um, he, I think Westfield for him was his first big break. And um, it was the first, first time that he was actually in control of his own restaurant. So that's how he started and that's how he built up his chain. And now his major flagship uh, tapas revolution is actually at Westfield Stratford, um, which he opened up in October, I think, 2019. Yeah, he's, he's been a real important role, like a, a real, a really important person um, in this journey because he sort of taught me what the crux of running a restaurant truly really means. His knowledge and without his guidance, I would have been completely clueless and I would have made a lot of mistakes and probably lost a lot of money. And before we go and speak about your restaurant now, Mehik, um, how did the pop-up go? Uh, lots of preparation, nine months to prepare for those two weeks. How did it go? What sort of feedback did you get? And did you get the correct feedback to say, yep, this is, this is for me. Let's open, go up and open up a restaurant now. Yeah, the pop-up went really, really well. I was actually really surprised at the response. Um, the first day is always quiet. And I think um, one of the mistakes that I made thinking that, oh, first day open, I'm going to make hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of sales. That does not happen. So um, kind of opened up and I was got a bit of a, a dose of reality um, very early on that people don't actually read a menu. People just see a price and they don't understand what they're getting. So before... We had the strategy. We were actually trying to do a set meal, I, I suppose you could say, which was a burger and like a carb and also some salads um, for £15. And I think people saw the price of £15. They think, oh my God, £15 for a burger or £20 for a burger, but even that included a drink. So we kind of made a mistake on the first day with pricing everything up as a set meal. And then what we ended up doing was pricing all those, all those items up individually. And actually we ended up making more money because the consumer was thinking, ah, oh, okay, $7.95 for a burger, $2.95 for this, £3 for that, £5 for this, and then maybe I'll just buy some extra Japanese for an extra four quid or something. And we ended up making more money that way. So it was a real eye opener the first day. And then the second day we learned from our mistakes pretty quickly, made huge dashes to the printers, called graphic designers, got everything changed and just try to turn everything around as quickly as possible. So the pop-up actually, touched the word, it went really, really well. We had a really, really crazy response. The people were queuing up for the burgers. People were smelling the ghee from the other side of the shopping center and coming in because they wanted to see what we were <laughs> cooking. And um, I was literally, we were selling out every single night. And it was just an amazing feeling to think, oh my God, people are actually ordering and asking for this butter chicken bomb burger that you've created, um, as well as all the other stuff that we had done. So it was really good. Um, so it went really, really well. Cool. So the, the two weeks of the pop-up happened. It, was a, it sounded like a success, but a lot of learning through that. It was obviously a validation step into uh, really thinking about the next step, which was you opening up a business in, in the food uh, restaurant space uh could you talk about what happened after those two weeks and then go into you know what brought you to starting up this restaurant i had um already set a goal in my head that i knew that if i was going to open up my first restaurant it would have to be in a prominent location in london otherwise i wasn't going to do it purely because you see so many concepts that don't really make it anywhere past a market or a box park or anything like that. And I knew that for me, that was not going to be the long-term goal. As much as I wanted to open up a restaurant site was location was completely key as, as with anything in property, you know, it's location, location, location. And without that, your business has no credibility. That's the way that I used to look at. That's the way that I look at it. Um, so following on from the pop-up, I went to go see so many different sites we went to go see hundreds of different areas. Um, when I mean hundreds, I mean hundreds. Like literally we're going from places up north, going down south. I went to lots of different districts of, like, sorry, uh, different boroughs of London, going and having a look at uh, different pop-up sites, going and having a look at more permanent locations. 
but there was nothing that I was quite finding that was right for me. And the ones that I did find, um, landlords, of course, were asking an arm and a leg for rent, or they were trying to gazump you at the last moment. So it was just a real struggle to find the correct site. But the funny thing is that because we are in Mayfair, it's, it's one of the key postcodes, I guess you could say, of London. So when people sort of ask you, how did you get there? My honest response is that I used to walk pretty much almost every day around London to try and find these sites. I'd go in the evenings because I'd be working in my dad's company during the day. So my dad's company is based in Wiltshire. So I would drive for two hours, go work in the office, come back. And then in the evenings and weekends, me and my husband would be walking around the whole of London or the key areas we wanted to be um, and look for sites. And then as soon as I'd find a site, I would go and contact these landlords, take cool bags worth of fresh food, take my deck with me and my business plan and tell them why they should put me in their units. And I literally was probably doing that for about a year and a half until I found the site that I'm in now. So I think that's the only, so when people say, oh, we don't know how you got there, the only way, like the only response I have to give them is, by doing legwork and hard work that's it and that is the truth so it's not, it's not just a simple case of are oh, you find an open location and, and then you can automatically go in you know it's a as a landlord they want a reliable business that will continue they don't want any hassle right so that's why you have to sell yourself i guess um to, to the landlord so if you want to be in a really prominent location in london say 90% of them are owned by major landlords. And these major landlords will not just let any Tom, Dick or Harry come in. Either you have to be a massive brand or like a really well-established restaurant or something from like the Alan New Group. So say for example, like a Parc Chinois or a Hakkasan was to go in there, it'd be, some, it'd, be, it'd be a different ball game. For any independent to try and break into the market, you have to be a somebody and they also have to also believe in your product and believe in you. Any like high street location, um, say for example, where I'm in Isleworth or like Ealing or somewhere like that, most, you know, nine times out of 10, it's just gonna be a private landlord and all they're interested in is, can you pay rent? Will you pay it? Is it gonna be on time? And that's that. But I had bigger aspirations for what I wanted to do with Bindas Eatery rather than sort of open up a neighborhood restaurant. Um, and I knew that if I really wanted to make an impact and do something big, it would have to be in a prominent location. And they don't take anyone seriously unless they see That's your really socials, they see you know what you're doing, um, and they taste your product. That's really interesting because obviously, I'm sure the Westfield pop-up that you set up had some uh, gave some meat to you know your, your case. Oh my and... God, of course. The thing is, <laughs> like, I'm going to be completely honest. Had I not, had I, had I not done the pop up at Westfield, had I not won the competition, and had I not already pleased a massive major landlord, they would not give me the time of day. They would just honestly laugh in my face um, and tell me just to frankly bugger off with my callbacks. There's no way that they would entertain any type of conversation with me ever. Brilliant, fantastic. So uh, let's talk about the concept for Bean Dasi Tree then. Obviously, I had the pleasure of dining there, and so we spoke about this a little bit then. But you mentioned previously that the food that you serve there is food that you might typically make at, make at home. So can you talk a little bit about the menu and what kind of atmosphere you're trying to create for diners that eat there? Um, so the menu is traditional plates and eclectic eats. So the one of the things I wanted to really, really emphasise um, with my style of cooking and what I do is that although I have traditional elements of being Indian and traditional Indian plates, um, I also have the ability to sort of marry herb spices and different produce, you know, together in order to make Indian food. So Bindas means in Punjabi to be a free spirit, I guess without any inhibitions and like a rule breaker. And I felt that it was really reflective of my style, my style of cooking and my ethos of like really who I am. Um, so the menu is mainly broken up of, I guess, different sections. As you can see, we've got small plates, things like watermelon jar, sweet potato bilgori, haddock pakoras, that sort of stuff. And then we have a burger and power section, which is literally, I guess you could say, twists on Indian street foods like a kima pao or a pao bhaji. Um, and also we offer things like the butter chicken bomb burger, which is what got me 
everywhere in the first place um, and the oh my gosh burger and the vegan Manchurian rolls um, so we did some so we got some unique takes on those so that sort of works really really well for the diner that only wants to come in for like burger fries and maybe an ice cream and, the, and then they want to go and then we also have like traditional Punjabi plates like rajma um, you know makhani of course lal mas which is lamb curry um, and all that sort of stuff um, the desserts that we have on there again are personal to me because everything that's on that menu is my own recipe and my own creation um so we have things like chocolate halva on there we have salted caramel gulab jamun and then we've got um different flavored gulfis and we have senia which is made with coconut milk because it's like a vegan version everything that you see on that menu is my recipe and it has been cooked by me either for occasions for dinner parties for birthdays uh, for my husband, everything in there has been made by me. And I really, really wanted to ensure that when I opened up a restaurant, that it would feel like an extension of my own home. Like all the cushions that you see in the restaurant, I have in my own home. So they're actually on my own sofa, they're either on my bed or anywhere. And I actually have the same rose gold cutlery at home that we eat from and the same printed plates that we have at home. So I really wanted to create more of a buzzy eatery vibe um, rather than a fine dining sit-in restaurant because I felt, I, I always feel that whenever I go to fine dining Indian restaurants, sometimes I feel a little bit hard done by with what I'm getting. And sometimes I don't feel like I've got to like, sometimes I feel like I haven't actually had real value for money. I realized that the only place that I would really go to if I wanted casual Indian food and to be able to eat and go and pay within 25 to 35 pounds would really only be to shoot and possibly gunpowder, nobody like nowhere else. Um, so I felt that there was a market for this kind of food um, and my offering basically. And I felt that my USP could really be a competitor, uh, which is obviously the burger and power section, all that sort of um, stuff. And yeah, like it's, it's been very, very well received. It's yeah. great to hear that you stand so tall and proud about your menu and your willing to put your stamp on it, Mehek. You know, you're not be hiding behind yeah. a menu, in fact, right? You're not saying, oh, well, we, we put this out there, see what people think. You're actually saying, you know, this is stuff I make at home. Yeah. I'm being tall and proud about it. This is who I am. This is what I like to eat. And hopefully you will enjoy, enjoy it too. Exactly. It's, it's great to see. The one thing is I don't make any excuses for my food. And the worst thing is that when you get people that come in and say, oh, don't you have bindi on the menu? I'm like, no, I don't have any jet-lagged Indian vegetables on my menu. <laughs> Everything that you see has been produced in England. Or, like, the only thing that isn't is my aubergines come from Sicily. Otherwise, everything else is pretty much British. So everything that you see here is not jet-lagged, locally sourced, and it's going to taste better. It sounds like, you know, you've planned this very, very thoroughly. Um, I think sometimes entrepreneurs or businesses especially maybe in the food space may just put like Sunny said slap on things on a menu and cross their fingers and uh you know hope that somebody makes the purchase or buys that choice uh on the menu could you kind of talk about the planning process that you had and uh, was that just kind of something that you did on the cuff or was this something that you thought absolutely before we open doors we're going to make sure that we have everything set in stone uh, on that menu it's a mixture of everything and the reason being is, again, with your location, you have to understand your demographic. You need to understand who's walking through your door. So I could have had like a more extensive burger and power section, for example, um, and put more things on there, which I've got. I, like, as in, I have a whole repertoire of like recipes, so I could have put in a lot more. You have to really understand who your demographic is walking through your door, because that's what's going to translate into revenue. So it is really, really dependent on your location because your location depends on, because your location determines your demographic. Your demographic is what is the dollar that's going to be coming in. And then you need to understand sure. who's paying the dollar so that it turns into money in your pocket and also business that you can keep afloat and sustain. It'd be great to touch on your day-to-day -day now, Mehek. So... Clearly, when you were at the pop-up, you know, you were getting into the midst of it. But running a restaurant now, there's lots of different things to manage, I guess. You know, front of house, the kitchen, uh, developing the brand, developing your menu, making sure customers are happy. 
What does your day to day look like nowadays? I don't know how to answer that question because one minute I could be working in the past, the next thing I could be going and getting, you know, turmeric from somewhere, or then I could be doing payroll, or then I could be having a rant on socials. So <laughs> I can't really tell you what my day to day is, but I work, I work in all aspects of the business. So not only am I the person doing menu development, doing branding, doing the, you know, the graphic lead on my graphics, also ensuring all the food tastes as it should, quality control, getting the supply in, doing payroll accounts. Should I carry on? <laughs> No, it's great. I mean, it, you, you clearly show that running a restaurant is not a one person job. It's not just cooking, is it? It's, no. it's not at all. No. You know what? And this is one advice I'll say to anyone. If you want to start a restaurant, you better make sure you love it because you will be there day in, day out, long, long hours. It is extremely satisfying, but you will have no life. The one thing that you have to be prepared for is to always get your hands dirty. If you are somebody that wants to have a restaurant because you think it's glamorous, get a business partner, get an investor and get someone else to run it for you. Then it's glamorous because then all you can do is say, oh yes, I've launched a restaurant in this type of district and blah, blah, blah. This is what I'm doing, but not actually get your hands dirty. So it is, it is probably one of the most rewarding businesses, but it's a constant juggling act. I think that's the best way to describe it. And you constantly have to wear so many different hats and it is hard work, not even just mentally, but physically hard work as well. Obviously, the elephant in the room situation with COVID um, is upon us all in so many different ways. How does that impact your business um, and how is that continuing to impact your business today? Um, and what are some of the things you're doing to stay afloat, perhaps? We have decided to close now for deliveries and for collection. Um, and we're not going to be opening until the restrictions have lifted um, and also until there's clear guidance. It's just not sustainable to plan for your business for tomorrow. You have to plan it literally weeks, you know, weeks in advance restaurants do because there are minimum, order, minimum orders on stock levels, you know, like minimum quantities and quotas we need to hit. At the same time, you're then paying for labor because, you know, you're paying for your chefs and for your front of house able to come in. You're also paying for, you know, overheads like electricity, all that sort of stuff. And it just becomes impossible to plan on such short notice. It has been crippling. It has been really, really destroying, soul destroying on the whole food and beverage industry. Honestly, I think we are the most hard hit and probably the only industry that actually has been scapegoated. I mean, restaurants really take precautions when it comes to social distancing, checking your temperatures, making sure that everyone is tracked and traced, making sure everyone is sanitized, everyone's wearing masks. We, you know, bleach everything all the time. So it's really, really been hard. Even though we've got an amazing location where the restaurant is, it also has affected us so badly because that area also depends so heavily on tourism and hotels being open, office workers, office, and then also congestion charge hit. It's just so many contributing factors that kill a business and cripple it. You just don't realize the knock on effects that it has. Even like having roadworks has really, really affected the business because delivery drivers so half of mayfair has been blocked off now because there are so many hotels going up you know from mandarin oriental suites to marriott suites and all that sort of stuff um that delivery drivers uber eat drivers simply will not turn up and take orders purely because there are roadworks and it'll take them an extra 20 minutes on their journey to get to you which means that the customer then ends up complaining so then the deliverer the uber eats driver will fib and say that they've collected it but we've messed up on our end or they simply won't show up and then that has also had an effect on our deliveries which is what you become dependent on if obviously you're not open for service so there have been so many contributing factors like knock-on effects that have really really affected this whole industry as a whole and then a lot of people have said well why did you open in the middle of the pandemic at the end of the day, 
there is no right time to open. Had I waited for another year, would the pandemic have gone? No, nobody knows. At the end of the day, we thought that when we had opened, that we were given some sort of green light that it was okay to open. Nobody knew that it was going to like, you know, transpire the way that it has or, you know, go on the way that it has. Nobody could have predicted that. And nobody could have predicted tier four happening. And nobody could predict a possible another national lockdown again, like in, in January. It's almost, it, it's, it's been a year now since we've all known and heard about this virus. And look at where we are. No, that's, that's fair. I mean, that's obviously, there's a lot of things at play here and totally understandable. So, uh, Meg, when I came to your restaurant, one of the things I noticed was you had a very well thought out drinks menu. Uh, are drinks uh, a key focus point for Bindas and should they be for restaurants in general? A hundred percent. So the main revenue that you get um, from restaurants or f and businesses is from drinks. Drinks is what really creates the most amount of revenue and gives you the most amount of margins. It's not the food, it's the alcohol. And I really wanted to make sure that you could enjoy the drinks on their own, as well as with the food that we create. Great, fantastic. Now the drinks sound, well, they, they tasted fantastic, but if you're in developing phase and you ever need a taster, uh, let me know, I'll, I'll be available. No, it's come just... over. <laughs> well, well, we were trying. So basically I've been, I've been developing. So cocktails are something that I am very, very passionate about. So I um, have actually just been working with my business partners um, and I've actually actually written a whole cocktail menu for them actually for their new restaurant they've opened up and I, they've got like a Pan-Asian concept. So I've written them a whole menu on Sakitinis. So Fantastic. I've got some more things coming in the pipeline. So I do need cocktail tasters because uh, I get tipsy drinking two sips, two or three sips and I'm a liability. So... <laughs> You're more yeah, than welcome to come. I'll make I'll, I'll make myself available for that, Meg. No problem at all. Just give just let me know and I'll be there. Meg, what would you say to perhaps the married woman, perhaps in a similar situation to you, considering opening up a food business? They really love cooking, um, and they don't know what to do. What are some of the first principles that you would uh, encourage or bring uh, bring to them to as they think about opening up a food business? I've been approached by quite a few girls that are looking to change their career, uh, go into food, either catering or something that they've baked cakes or something that they've always wanted to do. It's always been a dream of theirs, but they just don't know how to start. And I realized that it's going to sound really bad, but I realized that I end up investing a lot of my time trying to help these girls really go for it and take that initiative. But the thing is, is that it really has to come from within you. you. You're the one that has to have that eureka moment of, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to be fearless and I'm just going to do it. So the best advice that I can give is if you have something and it really, and you, if you have that desire and you have that dream and you honestly really want to go for it, you should just bloody go for it. There's always going to be excuse. There's always going to be an excuse not to do it. There's always going to be a reason not to do it and a reason to always put it off until tomorrow. So the only advice that I can give is go for it, find out what your USP is, find out who you're targeting, and what your demographic is. And if you have a really insanely good idea, just pursue it and go full force into it. At the end of the day, if you don't try, you'll never know. Food blogging is one of the best ways to go about it, but also, you know, use your friends and family. Use them as a platform in which to test recipes on or to cook for or to bake for or anything that you want to do, or even if it's food photography related or food writing related. It's something that, you know, just use your support mechanism that you've got around you because they're the ones that are going to help shape what you want to do in the future. Great. Fantastic. Uh, I guess the next question, Mehek, is a difficult one to answer given all the covid restrictions we have at the moment but what's next for you and for bindar sitri uh, and i guess what's the ultimate dream for you i guess the ultimate dream would be um to have a small chain of bindar eateries in really good select locations and then start another concept and then another concept another concept and just sort of snowball from there so onwards and upwards hopefully and i'd like to open up my second site hopefully soon so that's my dream and that's where I hope to be, hopefully. Well, fingers crossed for those. Hope that hope they work out. Yeah. Um, thank you. Annie, do you want to ask our famous last question? 
Yeah, sure. Okay, so Mehuk, uh, our last question for you today, and this is a, one that we ask all of our guests. If mm. you could invite any three guests for chai, living or otherwise, who would you invite and why? Lord Sugar, Oprah, and Beyonce. Okay, what, why, why so, those? Lord Sugar, great entrepreneur, funny as hell. I really think that he'd get my sense of humor and I'd get his. And I love... Um, his story, how he started, how he came about. Of course, Oprah, because she's like one of the most inspirational women of all time. Um, and it'd be great to actually learn off of her, have like a super soul session with her, let her, you know, assess and feed my soul with some like spiritual nurturing guidance. You know, that would be amazing. <laughs> and Beyonce, just because I have an obsession with her. Um, no other reason than that. I wish I could give you some more <laughs> that. I just feel that we would be really great best friends. That's I know, just being honest, but yeah. I can't believe I just said that. But yeah. <laughs> That's true though. Yeah. That's great. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that, Mehek. It's been really fascinating speaking to you and learn about Bindar's Eat Tree and uh, we wish you all the best for the future. Thanks so much for having me and thank mm. you. No, thank you. And where could we uh, or our listeners follow you or find you online uh, to learn more about you? Um, I guess you could find me um, on our website, so www.binlasteatery.com, or you could find us on Instagram, at binlasteatery. Um, and if you need any recipe inspo or any chefing uh, questions, then I also have my Mehek um, underscore binlasteatery account as well. So you can find me, I guess, on those three platforms. Great. Super. Fantastic. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh... Yeah, we're looking forward to visiting Bindasi Tree soon. Amazing. Looking forward to having you. Hi there. Thanks again for listening to the Business Over Chai podcast. If you like this content, please hit subscribe. And if you have any feedback, please give us a review. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter with the handle Business Over Chai or alternatively on our website, businessoverchai.com. Thanks again for listening.